do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Awesome words. Let's pray together. Great God of heaven, we thank thee for this class on Reformed Experiential Preaching. We pray that every student here may know moment, many moments in this class where not only will their minds be informed, but their hearts moved, their affections aroused, and their desire build for engaging in this kind of preaching for themselves and their own future pulpit ministries. Please be near to each one, also those coming in online. We pray for thy benediction upon um, all of the students that have signed up for this class. May it be a wonderful time in all of our lives, and may this class impact us for good to our heads, our hearts, and our hands. Go with us now, we pray, and confirm for us in the inner man in a deep and abiding way that this is life eternal, that we might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Fill us with love for thee, for thy Son. Give us an intimate knowledge of him, and that knowing him, we may rejoice with joy unspeakable, and may run to make haste in the way of his commandments. Lord, we wait on thee. Bless us now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, you have uh, the Reformed Experiential Preaching Syllabus on Populi. Um, I'll just quickly walk you through that a moment. The course description defines and explains both the discriminatory and applicatory dimensions of Reformed experiential preaching. Um, we'll be defining experiential preaching today, but let me just say to you that the two major branches of experiential preaching would be application and discrimination, hence the, this opening statement. We will examine how major reformers, English Puritans, Dutch Further Reformation divines, and two great preachers from 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries emphasize experiential dimension of vital Christianity in their sermons. So, first part of the course is we're going to take two weeks, maybe three, to define what experiential preaching is and give you a good flavor of it, a good pathos of it. Then we'll take probably seven weeks to start with Ulrich Zwingli, the first Reformed preacher. And we'll go all the way up to Lloyd-Jones. And I'll give you dimensions of experiential preaching. Uh, a little bit of overlap sometimes, but often unique, on different preachers. For example, Samuel Davies we might look at. How did he preach a conviction of sin in an experiential way? Uh, someone else we might look at. How did he preach Christ in an experiential way? So that's the center piece of the course. And then, of course, we want to cross the bridge in the last few weeks of the course and ask, how do we take what we learned in the first part, what experiential preaching is supposed to be, and the examples throughout church history, and apply it to today? How do we preach then experientially today? And we'll look at a number of, number of themes. All right, any questions about the, about the content of, of the course? So, course objectives, there's a lot more than four, but I've just listed four here. By the end of this course, you should be able to understand how the experiential direction, dimension of vital Christianity was preached by major reformers, English Puritans, Dutch, I um, should say, further Reformation divines. I, I used to always call it Second Reformation, and I got um, challenged more and more by the Dutch people. So. In all my writings, I'm changing second to further, so you can change that to further. I'll explain that later. And a few great preachers from 18th through 20th centuries. Number two, apply what we learn about experiential preaching to contemporary preaching. Number three, 
Practice the basics of experimental preaching by writing sermons on texts that emphasize the experience of vital Christian truth in the soul and life of the believer. And four, know the primary strengths and weaknesses associated with experiential preaching or experimental preaching. And then you have the um, course texts, uh, required reading. I've um, been gracious to you here, I believe, and cut back on, on some, of the, some of the reading. I uh, had a bit too much before, I believe. So some of the required reading before I've put into the recommended reading. <clears throat> and um, the best way to handle the recommended reading is uh, either A, uh, if you're terribly, terribly busy this semester and you're overloaded, <clears throat> save it for next summer's reading. Um, or B, uh, if you've got a little time, which would be great, just go to these books and spend a half an hour with each one and skim through and get the gist of what they're saying. And then if one or two of them really jump out at you as being really relevant to you as you're studying the subject, uh, re read them more carefully. But I will not be testing you on anything in the recommended reading, but uh, there is some very good stuff here. So the main things I want you to read um, are the six books mentioned there just bits and pieces of them. Uh, you'll, um, you'll find that to be, those chapters, I'm sure, to be helpful. Yes? On the, the third textbook of Heavenward Jonathan, Altogether Louder, I saw two books, they very closely different, but one with the subtitle is perfect, Excellency and Glory. Excellency and glory. You didn't find the book that's titled Altogether Lovely? Altogether Lovely. Huh? Well, at least available. I'll have it here. As far as Sotogar Gloria, I will go to Amazon and sell her. So it's paid to other sellers that they represent that you can get it from. Okay. At quite a cheap price. Okay. Okay. Mine's brand new as well. Okay. There's lots of people selling new and used ones. Okay. If you can't get it, see Simon, he'll help you get it. I don't know. Just compare it with the student who has the book. Okay. There's a lot of different books by Edwards. I don't want to deceive you and say that's the book. So um, just compare it and see, make sure it's the same. And I don't think, since it's such a small portion, I don't think it'd be that bad if a few of you couldn't really get it. I mean, you'd want to keep the book long term, but maybe you can borrow it with each other. But uh, if, it's a great book to, to read the whole book, really. If you want, I'll email you the ISBN number. Okay. okay. That's great. In terms of course requirements, uh, we have a midterm of six essay questions uh, based on both class lectures and reading assignments. The, I do my normal thing where I ask you to um, just have, there's one question of the reading and the five, five questions are based on the, on the class lectures. <clears throat> if you don't do the reading, however, there you just lost 16 percentage points one-sixth of the exam, so that's important to do the reading. And, um, that, can that question be taken from any of the, the assignments? So are you happy with it? Get all the reading done before the midterm? No. Um, yeah. Pick my brain on that a couple weeks from now, and I'll give you a week or two from now. I'll give you what you should have read by the midterm. Okay. Yeah. And then number two, the 15 to 20 page paper. It's required, which should be a study, a scriptural, theological, historical, or combination of some aspect of experiential preaching, a study of a few sermons of a particular minister noted for an experiential emphasis in preaching, or two of your own sermons written out in full based on a portion of scripture which emphasizes spiritual experience. Um, You cannot use, this is a trust system, you cannot use 
sermons you've done for other classes here. I want you to develop sermons that really flow out of what I'm saying in the lectures. And I will grade them accordingly. So pick texts that are very experiential in flavor and uh, develop those, those sermons. And you could consult me if you're wondering if a certain text uh, is, is workable. Um, if you're a THM student, you need to complete number one or two and number three. So I want to see the 15, 20 page paper as well as two sermons. Um, and then number three, the completion of the required reading assignments. Um, at the bottom of the Uh, I said on the bottom of the final exam, I actually took away the final exam. Say, at, at, the, at the last day of class, that's a little bit of a mistype there. At the last day of class, um, just shoot me a note, an email note, telling me what percentage that you've read of, of the reading assignments. Uh, if you've read 90%, you'll get a 90% for that section. If you've read 100%, which I see no reason why you can't read 100%, I mean, it's an easy way to get a 100% on a 15% of the grade of this class. So uh, it always amazes me, actually, when a student can so easily um, get a good grade by just doing some reading and, and then submits, submits and says, I read 70% of the material. And you get a C minus just because you didn't read, uh, take the time to read. So find the time to read. Pace your reading just like you pace your papers. Um, do diversity as you go through, plot out your schedule, and you should all be able to say 14 weeks from now, I read, I read 100%, and, and that would be a straight A for that 15% of the class. All right, then the last part is the course outline. And uh, I, like I said, I'll be revising that, but Basically, we'll be following the same order, probably doing a little bit less than what's here. This is pretty heavy going. Uh, we might drop a couple sections, but um, I'll be giving you fresh outlines as we go through that will be tweaked from this, but at least you'll get a feel from this outline uh, where, where we're going and what, what we'll be doing. All right, any questions on the, uh, on the class? Everybody has access to an outline now? Okay. Yep. Uh, for the paper assignment and so forth, each paper should be 15 to 20 pages, right? For each paper. It's, uh, oh, you only have one. You're MDiv, right? Yeah. yeah, you'd only do one paper, or you would do two sermons. You see that? Each sermon has 15 to 20 pages? No, no. A sermon, I don't know, a sermon written out in full, so in your circles, whatever, if it's 10 pages, 12 pages, whatever, however long you think a sermon should be. I mean, don't, don't submit something of three pages to me, but uh, something that would take you at least 35, 40 minutes to preach. Um, my circles, something that would take you 50 minutes to preach, because we preach a bit longer than most churches. All right, so a typical sermon is I'd say 10 to 13 pages. Any questions? All right. We are ready to begin. And we first want to ask the question about Reformed experiential preaching. But before that, I want to give you just a bit of intro. <clears throat> You've heard that preaching fills the head but the Holy Spirit alone can bring it to the heart. And so the minister shouldn't make applications because that's the Holy Spirit's task. You've also, no doubt, heard various sermons preached that really informed you and educated you, but didn't move you by God's glory to do God's will. 
In the worst case, this kind of preaching puffs up people with knowledge. In the best case, it is light without heat. It's very common today to hear preaching that touches the heart also, but not the head. This is the reverse kind of preaching. It can be emotionally moving. People leave the service fired up, excited, feeling good, but it's zeal without knowledge. Heat without light. It's like cotton candy. It's got lots of flavor, but no nutritional value. And it might bring people back for more until they get sick, but it will not nurture life. It will not develop maturity. The great tragedy about both of these abuses of preaching is that they sever the vital connection between truth and love in Christ. Ephesians 4.15 puts it this way, But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You see, it's not just that we need both truth and love. It's that gospel truth has not reached its goal until it produces gospel love. Love has no living, no powerful living, uh, no living roots without gospel truth. And therefore, the truth, the truth of Christ must be brought home to the heart by the Holy Spirit in order to produce the love that flows from God. And that's the kind of preaching we need. It fills the mind with truth, moves the heart with love, puts the hands into action. So by Reformed experiential preaching, we do not mean a merely aesthetic preaching where people walk away thinking, what a beautiful idea. It's not merely informative, imparting knowledge about the Bible and theology. It's not merely emotional, warming hearts and producing strong feelings. And it's not merely moralistic, instructing and exhorting what is right and what is wrong. Now, all of these elements will be present in good preaching. But none of them is the heart of the matter. At least not when it comes to experiential preaching. Reformed experiential preaching uses the truth of Scripture to shine the glory of God into the depths of the soul so that people are called to live holy and solely for God. In Reformed experiential preaching, we are broken and then we are remade. It's both exhilarating and humbling. In such preaching brings us face to face with the most glorious and delightful being in the universe, as well as face to face with our own profound wickedness. And so by such preaching, the holy God binds himself to sinful man, heart to heart, with a word of blood-bought grace. But what more precisely then is Reformed experiential preaching? Let's look at, let's look at it from a, a number of different angles and then we're going to conclude the lecture by um, developing a tentative definition, which we may not make today, but we should make uh, tomorrow. So the first point I want you to notice on the outline, uh, point A, is that experiential, or you could call it experimental Christianity, we'll look at those two terms a bit later, but basically they mean the same thing, is idealistic 
realistic and optimistic. And I'll explain that in a moment as well. Reformers like John Kelvin used to talk about experimental Christianity. Kelvin paraphrased Psalm 27 verse 9 this way, Make me truly to experience that thou hast been near to me, and let me clearly behold thy power in saving me. And then he comments, We must observe the distinction between the theoretical knowledge derived from the Word of God and what is called the experimental knowledge of His grace. And the latter, said Calvin, is when God shows Himself present in operation, yet must he first be sought in his word. So you seek him in his word, he then in experiential preaching, he takes that word and he applies it to the soul. And you meet him, says Calvin, in operation, that is working in you. And Calvin says that this is foundational to Christianity. But it must be experienced in this experimental way. William Perkins, the father of Puritanism, said that the spiritual knowledge of God consists in an experimental knowledge of Christ's death and resurrection, an effectual and lively knowledge working in its new affections and new inclinations. So what are these men talking about? Well, the word experimental comes from a Latin word that means, has a root meaning of to try, to prove, or to test. Now, Calvin did not wonder whether Christianity would crash like an experimental design for an airplane. That's not what he's talking about. The experiment, in quotation marks, the experiment envisaged here is not testing the Bible but testing us by the Bible. Now, the same root for experimental also shows up in the word experiential, in Latin at least. Experimental preaching, or experiential preaching, stresses the need to know, therefore, to know by personal experience the great truths of the Word of God. So it tests our personal experience by the doctrines and truths of the Bible. So an experiential preacher will bring truth to your heart in such a way that with the Spirit's blessing, it will illuminate who you are, where you stand before God, and what you need to be healed, as well as where you are headed. When I was about to leave active duty with the Army Reserves, a sergeant, uh, knowing I might be called up one day, uh, came by and he he laid his hand on my shoulder, and he said, uh, son, he was a huge guy, too. Um, he said, son, I want to I tell you something. If you're ever called back up into the Army uh, for active duty, I want to tell you that there's three things you, ne you need to remember about fighting. The first thing is you need to remember how the war should go. Everything you've learned in basic training, so on. Remember how the war should go, what you should be doing when you fight. So that's idealistic, right? Second, remember how a war really does go. And the war never goes the way it's supposed to go. Wars are messy, wars are bloody, wars are confusing, wars are surprising. The enemy is always trying to surprise. So you've always got to be readjusting yourself along the way. That's realism. Then remember, he said, thirdly, I mean, he didn't add the words idealistic, realistic. I'm adding them. 
he said, thirdly, remember the end goal. You're fighting for Uncle Sam. You're fighting for the U.S. flag. I forget exactly how he put it. But remember your vision, what you're doing this for. So that's your optimism. Your goal is to fight in such a way that you have a wonderful cause that you're optimistically striving after. Now, translated, I mean, after this man said this to me, I, I thought, wow, this is an incredible definition of experiential preaching if I translate it into preaching. So translating to preaching, we can say something like this. When a preacher preaches experientially, he tells you how matters ought to go in your soul's experience. That's the ideal. That's the Romans 8. We're more than conquerors and the spirit working and we're, we're crying out, Abba, Father, and nothing from the, can separate us from the love of God. All these wonderful things in Romans 8, this rich experiential chapter. But also an experiential preacher will teach you how things really do go in the Christian warfare. That's Romans 7, the battle, oh wretched man that I am, the good I would do, I find myself not doing, and so on. And then the experiential preacher will also preach to you about the end goal, about being in Christ and being headed to heaven and the glories of heaven and serving God forever in celestial bliss. The optimism of the future Christian life. All right? So the goal of experiential preaching is to take how matters ought to go, how they do go, and the end goal, and then apply that not only to my own personal soul's experience, but to everything around me to impact that experience. So that the experiential preacher would say, how should you be a good husband? Oh, that's just a practical topic, right? No, it's also an experiential topic. You're to be like Christ is to the church. How is Christ to the church? He gave himself to her, his whole self. So that's the ideal. As a husband, you have to give your whole self to your wife. That's an incredible assignment, man. And then there's the realistic goal. You don't reach that goal, but how can you be a better husband practically day by day, uh, grounded in the love of God that passes all understanding? And then what's the end goal? The end goal is that you present yourself and your, your bride one day without spot and wrinkle before the countenance of the Almighty God and you enter into glory through the blood passport of the Lord Jesus Christ to be the bride of Christ forever. So, what I'm saying is, every doctrine in the Bible, in the mind of an experiential preacher, even those that the, you think are just plain practical, are really experiential. These are things you must experience, you must know in the inward man. So, it involves your relationship with your neighbor, it involves your relationship with your church, it involves a whole life relationship, and that's what a lot of people they never seem to grasp about experiential preaching. They think it's just navel-gazing on your own inward ups and downs. Now, it can be that for some people, but that's an abuse of experiential preaching. Paul Helm, in an article in um, the Banner of Truth magazine, number 139, April 1975, a good article to read, says... The article is titled, Christian Experience. The situation today, and he's writing about the need for experiential preaching. The situation today calls for preaching that will cover the full range of Christian experience. A developed experiential theology. The preaching must give guidance and instruction to Christians in terms of their actual experience. It must not deal in unrealities or treat congregations as if they lived in a different century or in wholly different circumstances. This involves taking the full measure of our modern situation, entering with full sympathy into the actual experiences, the hopes and the fears 
of Christian people. So when we study experiential preachers of bygone centuries, it doesn't mean we preach exactly like them, you understand Paul is saying, but we learn from them and then we apply it to today's situation and say, how do we preach experientially today? That's a good part of what this course is all about. You'll hear much more about that. All right, so that's just the very beginnings of a definition. Um, now I want to build off of that uh, more aspects into that definition before we conclude with a tentative definition. But before I go on, any, any questions at this point? All right. Let's look at the next point on the outline then, discriminatory preaching. I already told you that the two biggest branches of, uh, of the trunk of experiential preaching are the big fat branch of discriminatory preaching and another big fat branch called applicatory preaching. And then out of those branches, um, there will be smaller uh, twigs and, and branches. By discriminatory preaching, of course, we're not referring to discrimination by color or by ethnic group or any form of bigotry or hatred. Rather, discriminatory preaching aims to distinguish the Christian from the non-Christian so that people can diagnose their own spiritual condition and needs. So the preacher applies biblical truth to help his hearers test, do I belong to Christ and have his spirit, or do I not? As Paul commands us to do. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Now, ministers, therefore, must use, as the Heidelberg Catechism says, the keys of the kingdom of heaven in preaching to open or shut the door of the kingdom. And Heidelberg Catechism, question 84, says, this is how you're to do it. Listen, listen to this question. When according to the command of Christ, it is declared and publicly testified to all and every believer that whenever they receive the promise of the gospel by a true faith, all their sins are really forgiven them of God for the sake of Christ's merits. And on the contrary, when it is declared and testified to all unbelievers and such as do not sincerely repent, that they stand exposed to the wrath of God in eternal condemnation so long as they are unconverted, according to which testimony of the gospel God will judge them both in this and in the life to come. So what I'm saying is that it's through discriminatory preaching that the Holy Spirit brings Judgment Day, near to the consciences of men, here and now. Either to vindicate them, to their joy, or to frighten them because of their guilt and their future abode if they continue on the way they are. So what we have here then is a kind of a, in discriminatory preaching, we have a breakdown between the Christian and the non-Christian but within that breakdown you also have different categories of different people within those two major subgroups, or two major groups. So, by discriminatory preaching, we also mean when we preach to God's people, distinguishing the maturity level. Is this just a babe in grace, as John puts it in his epistle, a young man in grace or a father in grace? That is to say, in discriminatory experiential preaching, 
But preaching also targets the spiritual maturity and condition of the preacher's audience. Now that's not easy because there's all kinds of hearers present. Archibald Alexander, first professor of Princeton, said this, the Word of God should be so handled that it may be adapted to Christians in different states and stages of the divine life. For while some Christians are like strong men, others are but babes in Christ who must be fed with milk and not with strong meat. And then Alexander goes on to explain how the Reformed preacher should rightly divide the Word by making specific applications to groups of people, like the backsliding, the worldly-minded, the afflicted, and the dying. Now, I think the best writer in this area, uh, though no one has developed it fully, but the best writer is, is, is Charles Bridges, um, 19th century writer, and I've, I've, I'm having you read that part in, in the Christian ministry. By the way, for an overall book on ministry, I think Charles Bridges' book on ministry is still the very best ever been written. Uh, even though it's, uh, what, um, 150 years old or more. And what Charles Bridges does is something very, very uh, powerful here. He says there are three aspects of discriminatory preaching. First, Discriminatory preaching must distinctly trace the line of demarcation between the church and the world. That is to say that there are two different kinds of hearers in front of you, the believer and the unbeliever, the Christian and the non-Christian. And this is what he says. They're described by their state before God as righteous or wicked. And after every one of these expressions, he, he has proof texts. And so you can look this up yourself. By their knowledge or their ignorance of the gospel... They're distinguished as spiritual or natural men by their special regard for, to Christ as believers or unbelievers, by their interest in the Spirit of God, being in the Spirit or having not the Spirit, by their habits of life, walking after and minding the things of the Spirit or the things of the flesh, by their respective rules of conduct, the Word of God or the course of this world, by the masters whom they respectively obey, the servants of God or the servants of Satan, by the road in which they travel, the narrow way or the broad way, by the ends to which their roads are carrying them, life or death, heaven and hell. So you pick up these eight or nine themes, and he's got an average of two texts, I think, supporting each one, and you just march through the Bible, and you'll see all these distinctions. The Bible is always discriminating between the believer and the unbeliever. So that's the first level. But secondly, the preachers must define and identify, says Bridges, the line that separates the false professor or the hypocrite from the true believer. In other words... This non-Christian may think he's a Christian. And so when you talk to him as a Christian, or you talk to him like most preachers do today, just looking at their audience and speaking to everybody as if they're saved, this non-Christian hypocrite sits in the pew and says, he's talking to me. And then, well, the preacher comes along, and this is just typical, isn't it? You've heard it a thousand times. Uh, Lord, if there's anyone in this audience of uh, 1,500 people, uh, if there's anyone in this audience who doesn't yet know the Lord Jesus Christ, please bring him to repentance today. And the hypocrite sits there and thinks, wow, maybe there's one person. I wonder who that would be, one person out of one. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible does. The Bible doesn't say there was one false virgin and there was nine true virgins. It says there are five false virgins. Five. You know, there's a greater possibility you, when you're preaching to 1,500 people that you're preaching to quite a few hypocrites. In that. So you've got to preach to those people and don't act like they're just outside the walls. Maybe, maybe one happened to slip through the doors. You distinguish in your preaching and you do what all the preachers of the New Testament did. You preach both to the saved and to the unsaved and uh, assume that they're there especially if you have a decent-sized congregation. Um, Jesus said that there were those who claimed to belong to the professing church, 
And they cried to him on the day, they will cry to him on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name haven't we done many wonderful works? And he will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work of iniquity. So of this second area of discrimination, where you're trying to show the non-Christian, trying to expose him uh, in, in experiential preaching, uh, Bridges says, Every part of the Christian character has its counterfeit. How easily are the delusions of fancy or feeling mistaken for the, for the impressions of grace. The genuineness of the work of God must be estimated not by the extent, but by the influence of scriptural knowledge in the soul, not by a fluency of gifts, but by their exercise in connection with holiness and love. Now, the... Uh, the Puritan missionary, David Brainerd, put it this way, labor to distinguish clearly upon experiences and affections in religion that you make a difference between the gold and the shining dross. I say labor here as ever you would be, if ever you would be a useful minister of Christ. So ministers need to help people examine themselves. This isn't something you just leave the Holy Spirit to do. Say, I'm just going to preach historical redemptive preaching and then the Holy Spirit does the rest. No. Go ahead and preach some historical redemptive preaching. But you have to make the application. That's part of your vocatio, your vocation. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves, says 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And pastors must help people do that. And so you don't presume regeneration in your people, and you don't presume unregeneration in your people. By their fruits they should know them. I mean, you can't see the heart, but you have to just preach in such a way that you make clear that those who experience this and that and the other thing are believers, and those who do not are unbelievers. If you don't experience any of your sin and misery, you don't experience deliverance in Christ, you don't experience a desire for gratitude and sanctification, you are not a believer, are you? If you don't experience the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, if you've never been spiritually poor before God, you haven't learned to mourn over sin, become meek before Him, hunger and thirst after righteousness, you're not a believer. Now, you need to tell people that. If you don't tell them that and you keep talking to them like they're believers, They'll believe they're believers when they're not believers, and then you can't shake them free from that, and they'll go to eternity, and as the Puritans would say, on the day of judgment, even though you get saved because you're a converted preacher, they will grieve over the fact that you never warned them to flee from the wrath to come. So it's critical that preachers set before their people the biblical marks and fruits of those who have been born again and have come to Christ by saving faith and genuine repentance. Then the third form of discrimination, Bridges says, and that's what Alexander was referring to, is the distinction of maturity levels within, among true Christians. The babe uh, or, or as it said in Mark 4, the, the, the blade, the, the ear, and the full corn in the ear. Um, 1 John 2, 12 through 14, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, and Mark 4, 28. Now, Alexander makes a good case for this. He says this, the promises and threatenings contained in the scriptures must be applied to the characters to which they properly belong. How often do we hear a preacher expatiating on the rich consolations of the exceeding great and precious promises of God, when no mortal can tell from anything which he says to whom they are applicable? In much of preaching, there is a vague and indiscriminate application of the special promises of the covenant of grace, as though all who heard them were true Christians and had a claim to the comfort which they offer. And then uh, Alexander goes on to say that after concluding that the saint and the sinner are clearly distinguished by decisive scripture marks so that everyone may have a fair opportunity of ascertaining to which class he belongs and what prospects lie before him, 
Alexander then goes on to lament, it is much to be regretted that this accurate discrimination in preaching has gone so much out of use in our times. <laughs> Can you imagine what he would say if he were alive today, where the preacher just indiscriminately applies the promises to everyone in his audience? It is but seldom, this is Alexander still, it is but seldom that we hear discourse in the pulpit which is calculated to afford much aid to Christians in ascertaining their own true character, of which will serve to detect the hypocrite and formalist and drive them from all their false, false refuges. In the best days of the Reformed churches, such discriminating delineation of character by the light of Scripture formed an important part of almost every sermon. But we are now more attentive to the rules of rhetoric than to the marks of true religion. How do Owen, Flavel, Boston, and Erskine abound in marks of distinction between the true and false professor? And the most distinguished preachers of our own country, the Mathers, Shepherds, Stoddards, Edwardses, it's also the Blairs, the Tennants, the Davies, and Dickinsons, were wise in so dividing the word of truth that all might receive their right portion in due season. Now, Alexander, Bridges, all the Reformed forefathers, at least all those who weren't, weren't uh, hyper-Calvinists, would say that grace is to be offered indiscriminately to all. You offer grace to all, but the divine acts and marks and fruits of grace must also be explained. And in that explanation, you see, you are encouraging the elect to know themselves aright, and you're uncovering the false hopes of the hypocrite. Bishop Joseph Hall put it this way, The minister's wisdom must discern betwixt his sheep and wolves, and within his sheep... Now notice the individual lines within these two categories. And within his sheep, betwixt the wholesome and unsound. And in the unsound, so now he's actually making another category. He's dividing, for example, the unsound or the, or the backslider. Now he's dividing another, another category, you see, even among believers. In the unsound, betwixt the weak and the tainted, and then he goes on and makes another category. In the tainted between the natures, qualities, degrees of the disease and infection, and to all these he must administer a word in season. He must have antidotes for all temptations, counsels for all kinds of doubts, evictions for all kinds of errors, and for all kinds of languishings, encouragements. Wow. What a task is before a preacher. How different this is from what we have today where many preachers, even Reformed preachers, say you should just preach to one group in the congregation all the time. You're preaching all the time to believers and you're making no distinctions among your hearers. That would have been anathema to the Reformers and the Puritans. Robert Hall, a 19th century preacher, says it is difficult to decide which we should anxiously, most anxiously guard against, the infusion of a false peace or the inflaming of the wounds which we ought to heal. So both are very, very wrong. You've got to be real sure when you preach that you don't discourage the troubled and tried believer. At the same time, you've got to be very strong on not encouraging the hypocrite. And what a challenge that is because the hypocrite is always thinking well of himself and the tribe believer is always thinking ill of himself. And when you make some application, many times it's the, the, the troubled child of God who will apply it to himself. Say, oh, that's me. I must not be a believer after all. And the hypocrite just, oh, well, that's not me. So it's a tricky business. You need a lot of wisdom. We'll be, we'll be talking all throughout this course how, how you do that. So, bearing all these things in mind, it's not surprising that Richard Baxter says, I warn you as preachers that you must be spiritual physicians 
And you must not apply the wrong spiritual medication to your parishioners so that you don't become a murderer of souls. Wow, a preacher, a murderer of souls? Well, if you apply the wrong medicine. You know, recently you heard a case of someone in an African country, I won't get more specific, uh, was misdiagnosed by, by, a, by a medical doctor, quite a reputable doctor. And then given the wrong medicine, the person died in two days. Um, spiritually, I can give you an example. There was a minister who um, met my grandfather on my mother's side when he was in his 20s in the state of Wisconsin. My grandfather poured out, he, my grandfather was, God was, he was a babe in grace, but he poured out in all simplicity his faith. And the minister said to him, I don't think that's the true work of the Holy Spirit. It's a terrible thing for a minister to say directly to a person. You don't say that. What you do is you set out the marks of grace. You don't tell somebody, I think you're saved, or I don't think you're saved. You can't see the heart, but you set out the marks of grace. That's what the minister should have done. Instead, he told my grandfather, no, that's not the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, that plunged my grandfather into tremendous despair. He struggled with that till he died at the age of 85. For 50-some years, he struggled with that. So you can be a murderer of souls. So it's on both sides. I would, I would hate to think of, of standing before Christ on the day of judgment and having someone be able to say to me there, you know I'm unsaved, but you never warned me to flee from the wrath to come. Terrible. But I also hate to be there and say, hear somebody say, well, by the grace of God, I made it to heaven, but I had a terribly rough life. My whole life was, I was in spiritual bondage because you, you, uh, you told me awful things about myself that made me think that I was never saved when really I was saved. So we, we have just this tremendous responsibility as spiritual physicians to make right diagnosis and then apply right medicines to different groups of people in the congregation. All right, any questions about discriminatory preaching? All right, we'll say some words about applied preaching. I'm sure you have more questions as we, as we move along. Applied preaching. Experiential preaching is always applicatory. It takes the text that's being expounded and it strives to bring it from, in the preaching, above the realm of what Paul calls the form of godliness without the power into the powerful applicational ministry of the Holy Spirit, realizing, of course, that the Spirit alone can do it, but it strives to preach in such a way that honors what that Spirit wants and believes that that Spirit will do the job. Robert Burns, who wrote the introduction to the complete works of uh, Thomas Halliburton and stressed that he was an experiential preacher, then said, experiential uh, preaching is bringing home the truths of God to men's businesses and bosoms. And he adds, Christianity should not only be known and understood and believed, but also felt and enjoyed and practically applied. And you see, that's what you find in Paul all the time. He wants that gospel. He wants that gospel to come to the Thessalonians, not in word only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 and 5. Baxter, Richard Baxter says of Paul, he wants to take truth like a screw and screw it into the minds of men. It's a rather gross picture, but uh, you, you get the feeling. He wants the truth to be screwed in bit by bit. It would grieve one to the heart to hear what excellent doctrine some ministers have in hand, said Richard Baxter, while they yet let that excellent doctrine die in their hands for the lack of close searching, living application. 
Now, from my background and my experience, having sat under experiential preaching all my life, um, maybe it just jumps out at me more than it does most people, but you can hear some of the greatest preachers in America, and they can preach wonderful, clear sermons about doctrines, and you say, amen, this is the truth. And then suddenly they say, amen. And you go, what? <laughs> what are you going to apply to different people? And they just leave it all to you to, apply, to make the application. Well, I'll tell you something. You leave it to all the people to make the application. That's like going to a physician and he says, you know what? Here's what people need to be healthy. But uh, now you figure out whether you're healthy or not all by yourself. And don't tell me your symptoms. Don't tell me anything. I'll tell you what a healthy person is, and you figure out, you take it up from there, and you, describe, you decide what medicines to give to yourself, how to go about it. You say, wait a minute. I'm not a doctor. I don't know all this. Same thing with your people when they sit in front of you on Sunday. Yes, hopefully after years and years of preaching, you won't have to always spoon feed them, but there will always be people in the church you need to spoon feed because they're always at the very beginning. It's amazing when you're a preacher. It's amazing. It's discouraging, I'll tell you, how few people in your congregation really know how to apply a sermon to their own soul. You have to model it for them from the pulpit. And the more you do that, the more they'll learn how to apply it to their own soul because they'll learn from your applications. So application is a major, major emphasis, probably the major emphasis of experiential preaching. It was said of Jonathan Edwards' preaching, all his doctrine was application and all his application was doctrine. Well, that may be a bit of exaggeration, but um, you get some of these great preachers like John Kelvin, uh, Jonathan Edwards, and you actually, you actually break it down and look at their sermons, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, you will discover that many times more than 50% of the sermon is application. Calvin is always saying things like this in his sermon. Now, what this should teach us is, or what we should do with this now is, and it's almost like he's rushing to get through his exegetical unfolding to get to the application. And Edwards, well, sometimes they'll have a sermon, right? You've seen it. Uh, you know, two or three pages. And then there'll be the word application centered on the text, on the page. And then you look and you think, well, this is just going to be like half a page, right? We'll round off the sermon. You turn over the pages, and say, what? There's two whole more big, great, big pages with small print, all application. Turn over, there's two more. And you say, wait a minute, 70% of this sermon is application. Today, the average preacher in America has less than 5% application from the sermon. And you're happy if you hear that much. So it's no wonder people go home and say, I don't know what to do with that sermon. Because the minister didn't bring it to my bosom and to my business. Charles Spurgeon exaggerates only slightly when he says, where the application begins, there the sermon begins. I, you know, I think the sermon begins where the sermon begins. But I understand what Spurgeon is saying, because what really is preaching? How does preaching differ from lecturing? Well, or teaching, for that matter. Preaching is really teaching plus application. You know, I gave a talk in Germany once. In fact, the only time I've ever preached in Germany, uh, it was for the School of Pietism in Halle. And um, I thought, wow, what an invitation. They wanted me to, to give a lecture on the differences between the Dutch Further Reformation in the Netherlands and German Pietism in Germany. So I put, I put hours and hours into this. I, I, was, I was quite comfortable on the Dutch side, but I, I hadn't studied German pietism that much, so 
I don't know, I probably put 75 hours into this lecture and learned a lot about German pietism in the process. So, I mean, I, I benefited from it. And, uh, you know, I heard things about the University of Halle, how big it was, and I had no idea how many people to expect. You know, I just kind of envisioned maybe 500 to 700 people. And I got there, I couldn't find, I couldn't find it. And the lecture's coming closer. My wife was with me. We're asking people, trying, and a lot of people couldn't understand English, and we were panicking. We could not find the lecture hall. Finally found the lecture hall, and it was just a little room. And I walked in, and there were 13 people behind desks. And I began to think, I came all the way over the ocean for 13 people. What I didn't know at the time is that Germany is awash in money for scholarly studies. They don't, they don't want to do with all their money, so it's nothing for them to invite someone from the other side of the world just to speak to a few people. So I, would, I proceeded. I gave my lecture. The first half of my lecture was basically about various differences, and then I had six applications, which is the second half of my lecture. And as I lectured, these are the pre-computer days, um, the students are writing assiduously. Every one of them, no one's even looking at me. They're taking everything down. So I'm thinking, I'm starting to feel better, right? I mean, yeah, I was only 13, but wow, they're, they're really drinking this in. It's going to be okay. And then I said, now I'd like to make some applications. And all 13, as if they were in a band and they put it all together, they, just went, they all put their pen down and they sat back, didn't take another note the whole time. And I was so befuddled. I said to them afterward, I said, what? What went on there? Why, why no notes under the application? You got to the most important part. And they looked at me befuddled and they said, well, we don't know why you applied it because we're not interested in application. I mean, we don't believe any of this stuff. We just wanted to hear an objective talk on the differences and we, we, we couldn't care less what to do with it. It's amazing. I felt so deflated. It was the worst trip, worst conference, worst lecture, worst experience I've ever had in my life going anywhere. I went all the way over the ocean to give 13 people some information I could have just shot across to them on, on an email about some facts and all the rest they didn't care about. Now, I don't know what the Lord did with it afterward and, you know, the Lord's promise my word shall not return to me. Void, so may maybe God began to work in somebody, but that's very discouraging. But woe be to the preacher who sets up his people that way. And when you get in the ministry someday and you get more than one person coming to you, you always get one that can complain about anything, but you get more than one person coming to you say, you know, I don't, I don't feel, I know what to do with sermons after you preach them. I don't understand why that's important, what you just said, how that should impact me. You hear complaints like that? That's huge. You better go back to the drawing board and say, how can I bring this sermon in a more real and practical way to, to, my, to my people? All right, there's a preacher in town uh, right here now. He came a while ago and... Uh, I've talked to maybe five people from his congregation. All five have said the same thing to me without me asking. They say, yeah, we really like our new preacher. He's a great guy, very nice personality, good to be with, but uh, boy, I just can't understand his sermons. They're, they're over my head. So we don't quite know what to do. We don't want to leave the church, but my kids aren't getting anything out of it. And, I must admit I'm not either because I, I just, I mean, intellectually it's very stimulating while you're there. It stretches you, but I don't know what to do with the sermons. Don't be that kind of preacher. The best preachers today include application throughout their sermons. Throughout their sermons. And, uh, it has to vary. You can't always have a kind of sameness in your sermon. But basically, one of the best ways to preach today, and we'll get more to this later, is to make a point exegetically, 
explain it, and then apply it before you move on to the next point. In the olden days, in the 16th, 17th century, when people were not so distracted, they didn't have internet, they didn't have all these other things that distracted them. And they worked on the farm all day long, and coming to church was the highlight of their life. And they were trained in rhetoric and logic. They could remember categories and subcategories. And they could have a long attention span. Like Jonathan Edwards, you could afford then to go for 30 minutes, 35 minutes in pure doctrine, and then you can make all the applications, nice and tidy. Today, I usually say in, in Homelex 1 class, uh, try never to go more than seven minutes with pure doctrine before you make an application because people just can't sustain it. Their mind is going to wander. It's, it's pitiful, but you've got to preach realistically. So the best method today is uh, you know, doctrine or, or, or exegesis, doctrine, application. Exegesis, doctrine, throughout your sermon. And then at the end of your sermon, wrap it up with two or three or even four Concluding applications. And make sure that all of these applications, or nearly all of them, can be understood readily by a 13-year-old. You can't make everything in your sermon easily understood by an 8-year-old. You just can't do it. You'd be dumbing down too much. Many parts they should understand. And you can reach down to them at special times in your sermon. That's great. But a 13-year-old should be able to grasp nearly everything you say. And you know what? People that are very intellectual, very well experienced, they like simple sermons as well. So try not to go above the heads of your people. You just lose so much when you do that. People tune out before you're done. And try to, therefore, salt and pepper your sermons with good applications throughout. Good applications throughout. Very, very important. All right, that's as far as we're getting today. Any final questions there? All right, it's one fifteen already. I can't believe it. Didn't get very far, but that's the way it is. And these, this, these are important foundational things. So if it takes me an extra week to lay all these foundations, uh, it's, it's going to be worth it. Okay, we're, we'll start on this end. Diano, if you offer a prayer, and then at the close of the classes, we'll just keep going around uh, at the close of each class.